Hello and welcome to today's lesson looking at circular motion. Now this particular part of the A-level course links into the further mechanics topic which is found as topic 6 of the AQA A-level physics specification which is found on paper 1 of the A-level AQA examinations but is not found on the AQA AS physics specification. Now in today's lesson we're going to try and understand the properties of centripetal forces and how they link into circular motion. So we are going to try to describe and calculate angular motion, understand the impacts of centripetal forces and look at how you convert angular measurements between radians and degrees. So it links into this following part of the AQA A-level physics specification circular motion which like I mentioned before is on paper one of the AQA A-level physics uh, specification but is not found on the AS specification. So in this topic we're going to consider the physics of circular motion. Now an example of circular motion would be an orbit. So here the moon Phobos is orbiting Mars so it is carrying out angular motion. Now in previous mechanics topics we've considered linear motion, motion in a straight line, but in this, in this mechanics topic we're going to consider angular motion, motion in a circle or motion radially. So this builds upon the concepts that you learned in the mechanics and materials module you carried out earlier in the course. Now another name for angular motion is circular motion. So in today's lesson I may say angular motion, I may say circular motion, I may say radial motion, they all mean the same thing. Now, when an object is moving in a circle, it is carrying out angular motion, all, all these objects have two velocities. The first type of velocity is the angular velocity, the rate at which the object moves in a circle. But there's also a tangential velocity, and that's the rate the object moves in a straight line if the force causing it to move in a circle would be removed. Now another name for tangential velocity is linear velocity, which is the quantity you just called velocity previously. So when we previously mentioned velocity, uh, in a sense of a circular motion, you can call that property either tangential velocity or linear velocity. Now, throughout its angular journey, the object's tangential velocity is always changing direction. Because, as you can see, the direction of tangential velocity is the direction in which the object will move off if, that's, if that force causing angular motion is removed, which is at a tangent to its current path, which is where the name tangential velocity comes from. But as it moves in a circle, the object's tangential velocity is always changing direction because when that, that force is removed, which is causing a circular motion, it will cause a tangent, which is in different directions in different parts of the orbit. Now, these concepts can lead to our understanding of forces in the application of circular motion or the understanding of the mechanics of the circular motion. Now, let's understand what's going on. Now, angular motion is the motion of an object projecting a circular path. When objects move in a circle, they're constantly changing velocity or tangential velocity as it's changing direction. So this change in velocity is an acceleration. Now, the only thing that will cause an acceleration is a resultant force, which comes from Newton's first law of motion, which you've covered earlier in the course. Now, the category of resultant force which causes circular motion is what we call a centripetal, or as American people tend to say, centripetal force. Now, the centripetal force always acts towards the center of the circle of rotation. Now, there are many types of centripetal forces in the real world. So, for example, there's a centripetal force causing the Earth to orbit the Sun. There's a centripetal force causing the Moon to orbit the Earth. There's a centripetal force causing a car to go around the roundabout. Now, that can be friction, that can be gravitational attraction, it can be electromagnetic attraction, 
Okay, so different forces can be acting as a centripetal force. Now, any object undergoing circular motion will experience a centripetal force. Now, a centripetal force is the name given to the overall resultant force experienced by the object. Now, we only ever consider the resultant effect of the centripetal force, the overall effect of that force causing circular motion. Now, an object undergoing circular motion will experience a centripetal force, which is a resultant force towards the centre of the circle of rotation. The centripetal force always acts towards the centre of the circle. Now, a most, the most common application of centripetal forces is the orbit of a planet around a star. So let's consider the motion of the Earth around the Sun. Now, technically, the planets actually move in an ellipse, a squashed circle, due to a variety of gravitational effects, but well, let's just assume it's a circular path for the time being. Now, the planet will always have a direction of motion tangential to the star. Now, as it orbits, the Earth changes its tangential direction because it's moving in a circle. So, like we said before, this means the velocity is changing as the direction is changing, so therefore it is accelerating. And for Newton's second law, or for Newton's first law, if there's an acceleration, there must be a resultant force causing that acceleration, which we call the centripetal force. Now, centripetal actually means center-seeking force. So, the force always acts towards the center of the circle because the Earth is constantly being dragged towards the centre of the Sun, or the, well, the, the common centre of mass of the Earth and the Sun, which is predominantly where the Sun is, okay? so therefore it's a centre-seeking force. But you might ask, well, why does it not just get pulled in? Why does it move in a circle? Well, that's because there's another effect on the actual object, because the, an object such as a planet, will want to move in a straight line in the same direction, i.e. the same velocity, unless the resultant force acts on it. That is Newton's first law of motion. Now, this phenomena we call inertia. So we covered this previously, that any object in motion will have inertia if there's no resultant force acting on it. Now, the centripetal force acts in another plane to where this inertia is taking place, and so the centripetal force always acts towards the centre of the orbit, which is not in the same plane as the inertia. Now, the centripetal force acts perpendicular to the path of the object. It acts perpendicular to the motion. It acts perpendicular to where this effect of inertia is. So any force that we define that acts perpendicular to motion is acting as a centripetal force, which is going to become really important the later we move on in the course. So we we can understand that any object acts as a centripetal force if it's acting perpendicular to motion. Now we'll cover many different forces acting as centripetal as forces in paper two, such as the magnetic force, the electrical force, the gravitational force. At different points, they will all act as centripetal forces. Now, as the force acts at, the, at right angles to motion, it can't actually affect the speed of the motion of the object. Now, that means that centripetal forces can't change the speed of an object, but what they can do is they can change the direction of the object. So, centripetal forces, a resultant force, will cause acceleration, not by changing the speed of the object, but rather by changing the path. What we say is it causes acceleration by a deflection. So, the inertia and the centripetal force combine to form the path of the circular motion. So the centripetal force provides an acceleration towards the centre of the object and inertia wants the object to continue to move in a straight line with the same speed, so therefore it prevents the body falling into the centre. Those two effects combine to ensure the object follows a circular path. Now before this was known, before we understood this, Physicists thought that the, a circular force must cause a circular motion, which was called the centrifugal force, but that doesn't exist. That's incorrect physics. That's what we call a fictitious force, a force we assume to exist based on observations that we have, but in, rea in reality, it's the combination of two, of two different effects sum enough to find the circular motion. So centrifugal forces technically are actually a combination of inertia resisting the centripetal force. 
So this means if the centripetal force was removed, so in our example of the Earth and the Sun, the Sun somehow disappeared, the object would move in a straight line in the same direction because there's no longer that resultant force pulling it towards the center of the circle. So it would move off in a tangent. So this would revert the object back to the laws of linear mechanics which you've covered previously. Now, when considering our circular motion, we've got to consider two types of velocity. So we've got our linear velocity, which is the uh, velocity an object will take if the centripetal force is removed, and the blue arrow indicates the object's angular velocity, or its velocity in a circular path. So the red arrow represents the object's velocity in a straight line or linear velocity. It's the rate of displacement in a straight line, where the blue arrow represents the object's velocity in a circular path or angular velocity. It's the rate of displacement in a circle. Now we measure the displacement in the linear velocity as a length, but we measure the displacement in the, in the angular velocity as an angle. So to calculate the angular velocity, we've got to consider the angular displacement. And that is the amount of angle that has been changed when the object rotates in a circle. So let's consider the object as it travels from x to y. Now it's traveled, it traveled a distance of s, so we, we consider the arc to have a distance of s, and it's covered a section of a complete circle. But it's also covered an angle of theta, which we'll call the angular displacement. How much the object is moved in a circular path? Now we know from mathematics that theta is equal to arc over radius, or s over r. So what we can then do is we can then put an, a, a unit into that angular displacement. Now the SI unit for an angular displacement is the radian. Now a radian is the angle made by an arc equal to the radius of a circle. Now we know the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r, where r is the radius. So this implies that 2 pi arcs with the length of a radius that would fit in the circle. So therefore we can deduce that there must be 2 pi radians in a complete circle. So what that means is... 360 degrees of an angular displacement is also 2 pi radians. Half a rotation, which is an angular displacement of 180 degrees, is pi radians. A quarter of a rotation of a circle is 90 degrees in, of an angular displacement, or it's pi over 2 radians. So therefore, if we link this through, the two quantities link as the following. 1 radian is equal to 360 divided by 2 pi, because there are 360 degrees in a circle, and there are also 2 pi radians in a circle. So 1, pi, one radian is 57.3 degrees. So you've got to be able to convert from radians to degrees and vice versa. So to convert from degrees into radians, you times your degrees by 2 pi over 360. And to convert from radians to degrees, you convert your radian value from 300 times by 360 over 2 pi. Now this should hopefully be second nature to you after you've already done the phase difference in the waves part of the course. So here's an example converting from degrees to radians. So convert 45 degrees into radians. Well, you do the degrees, which is 45, times by 2 pi over 360. So it's 90 pi over 360, which when we work it through is pi over 4. Now, when doing theoretical work, you can leave your answers for radians in terms of pi. But when you're doing this for practical terms, you can't leave answers in terms of pi. Because pi is an irrational number, so it has an infinite number of significant figures. So it implies that you know your answer to zero level of uncertainty. There is no uncertainty in your work, which can never be the case in practical work. So when so this means that in experimental work, you've got to place these answers to the correct number significant figures and not leave them in terms of pi. Now, how do we convert from radians to degrees? Well, we do radians times by 360 over 2 pi. So 2 pi over 7 times by 360 over 2 pi is 360 over 7, which when we work it through is 51.4 degrees, and we give it to the same as the figures as given in the question, so it's 51.4 degrees. Now, the radian is a much more acceptable unit as it's based in mathematics. It's an angle made by an arc equal to the radius of the circle. 
So whilst the degree is an arbitrary unit, there's no profound or, or logical reason as to why there should be 360 degrees in a circle. There is a profound reason to the size of the radian. It's the link between circumference and radius, and it's much more important when we want to be looking at values in the future. So it's a lot more important rather than just describing things in just uh, degrees, because there's no profound reason for the size of a degree in terms of angles. Now, just to get back to where we were looking at in terms of velocity, linear velocity, or the velocity, or something called velocity previously, is the velocity of an object moving in a straight line. The angular velocity is the velocity of an object moving radially, how quickly it turns in a circle. And remember, another name for linear velocity is the tangential velocity. Now, this means the instantaneous linear velocity at a point is given by the letter v and is measured in meters per second. Okay, and this is the velocity the object would have if it travelled in a straight line if the centripetal force was removed. Whilst the angular velocity is the angle through which the radius of a circle turns in one second. It's given the symbol omega and is measured in radians per second. So, the angular velocity is the rate of change of angular displacement or the angle covered every single second. So, theta, which is measured in radians, is the angular displacement carried out in a journey. Time is in seconds, so the, so our our value for angular velocity omega is theta over time. So it's measured in radians per second. Now this is the same calculation as linear velocity, except the displacement is an, at an angle, not a straight line distance. But we can also link this back in to an equation for linear velocity because we know from linear mechanics, which we covered previously, velocity equals displacement over time. But from the angular displacement equation, we know that dis displacement is equal to r theta from our previous equation. So we sub that in. And we also know that theta equals angular velocity times by time. So you work that through and you get an equation which states that linear velocity is equal to angular velocity times by the radius of the circle, or v equals r omega. So let's have a look at how you'd answer this type of question. So... Here you have got a, a student called Luke being whirled around by his ankles in a circle. The, the circle has a radius of 1.78 metres. The angular space and experience is 12 pi over 7 radians in 14.2 seconds. What is angular velocity? What is linear velocity? Well, you can, you can work out what his angular velocity is because it's his angular displacement over his time. So you can put those values in. You work it out to 0.379 radians per second. Now, note we don't leave our answers in terms of pi because that would imply infinite significant figures. You then pop that into the equation V equals R omega. And we know what R is. We've just worked out omega so we can work out what V is. And it's 0.756 meters per second. Note we're given both, va both values to the correct mistake of figures with the correct units, and note his linear velocity and his angular velocity are different values, so you've got to calculate each separately. So, the idea of angular motion was first theorised by Isaac Newton when he imagined the idea of placing something in the orbit of Earth, because this would lead to circular motion, which le leads you to a very famous experiment called Newton's Cannon. So consider the following. You've got a ball thrown out horizontally. It will fall to the ground some distance away because the gravitational attraction will pull it towards the centre of the Earth. So all objects are attracted to the centre of the Earth due to the gravitational attraction of the object in the Earth. So a rifle bullet, even though it would be fired faster horizontally, would also reach the ground eventually. Now, it acts like a projectile. Now, if you consider firing a bullet so fast that it covers an appreciable part of the Earth's circumference before it reaches the ground, it will, what we will call fall over the edge of the Earth. So basically, the Earth falls away from the bullet uh, at the same rate the bullet falls. So the gravitational attraction is still acting downwards, however, the Earth is falling away as it's curved okay, from the bullet as it does. So this means the bullet never hits the ground. So that occurs due to the curvature of the Earth. So what that means is the bullet will keep falling over the edge, so it will just go around the Earth, keeping it just above the ground, until it reaches back at the starting point and hits us, or well, well, will we'll knock into us in the back of our heads. So 
This is what we call an orbit. Okay, it's because it is going around in a circle a lot around the Earth. Now, the speed required to achieve this is called the orbital speed, which is going to be much lower than the escape velocity, which would be the velocity required to escape the, the gravitational field of the Earth. So that would hurt us if it come back and hit us in the back of the head. Now, the object, the, the ob orbital speed is the speed needed to maintain a stable orbit, whilst the escape velocity is what's needed to overcome the gravitational field, so therefore, the orbital speed will be lower. Now, the bullet started off as a projectile with a, with a constant horizontal velocity and a vertical uh, acceleration due to gravity, therefore, at every point in the orbit, the Earth's, the Earth's satellite, this bullet, must have a constant acceleration towards the centre of the Earth, so it's got a centripetal force, it's acting towards the centre of the circle, and it's acting perpendicular to circular motion. So now we've got a centripetal acceleration. We've got an acceleration towards the centre, we've also got inertia, so therefore we get our circular motion. So we say the bullet's now in free fall, because the bullet has fallen, but there's nothing there to catch it. The earth is curving away from it as quickly as it's falling. So the combination of the centripetal force and inertia produce this circular motion. This means the bullet will never hit the earth, so in theory it'll never actually experience weight, because whilst there's a force of weight acting on the bullet, the centripetal force, you'll have no experience because it will never hit the surface and then produce this normal contact force, which is how we interpret weight as humans. Okay, so, you can imagine that if you threw a stone fast enough, it would orbit the Earth because it's always fallen towards the Earth at the same rate the Earth falls away from it. The projectile becomes a satellite. So orbital motion is the projectile motion, which you covered previously, under the condition of free fall. So orbits are produced by bodies uh, being orbited, falling away from, this or from the orbital rate with the same acceleration as the centripetal acceleration. So satellites accelerate towards the Earth, but the Earth moves away from the satellite, so the falling satellite never hits the Earth, so the satellite goes into orbit. So the or objects in orbit will have a centripetal force of weight acting on them, but they don't experience this force due to the lack of contact with another surface. So what have we learned in today's lesson? That motion in a circular path at a constant speed implies as an acceleration and requires a centripetal force. The magnitude of angular speed is, uh, is omega equals v over r, or 2 pi, which we'll look at next lesson. And we also know how radians can measure the angles. So in today's lesson, if you've been successful and learned, you can describe and calculate angular motion, you understand the impact of centripetal forces, and you can convert angular measurements between radians and degrees. I hope you've enjoyed today's lesson, and thank you very, very much for listening.